Well, uh, we are in the final sermon of our, our series about Baptist distinctives. And uh, this one is a little, <laughs> little unique or odd, I guess. Uh, I've said this before, that most of the time when we preach from the pulpit, we present ideas that we think 90% of you will find interesting or engaging. But occasionally I think it's worth talking about ideas that we know that only 10% of you will find engaging or entertaining. This is one of those 10% sermons. So if you are bored out of your tree, uh, just assume that someone within eight or 10 positions of you is actually entertained or entertains the wrong word, is engaged in what we're talking about. Uh, today we want to talk about a Baptist idea that, uh, that we share with some other groups but is actually fairly Baptist. And that is the idea that there should not be a state religion or a state church. And again, I know that's not going to be all your cup of tea. Today's sermon has uh, two large lessons in church history or in history in general. So if you're a history buff, hopefully some of that will be engaging for you. We're going to talk about some text, some scripture, as we always do, um, and, and tie those into some of the ideas. But this is probably not an idea that's going to resonate with all of us, or at least the sermon is not. This idea of no state religion or church may seem kind of standard to those of us that live in Canada, but it certainly was not always that way. And that's part of what we want to discuss today is how we came to this idea or this conclusion. I want to start us with some scripture today. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 to 22. Matthew 22, verse 15 to 22. So this is a text from the Gospels, and it's a spot where people come to Jesus in order to ask him questions. And so Jesus would often teach in the public sphere. He would talk to crowds of people and groups of people. And during that time, people would often bring questions to him or ask him things. What we see in this text and realize often from what they ask is they're usually fairly motivated in what they're asking. And so they don't do so for altruistic reasons. And this text is one of those, one of those times where they have a hidden agenda. So Matthew 22, verse 15. It says, Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, We know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to, what, to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and so they left him and went away. So Jesus starts by acknowledging that there was some hypocrisy in what they were doing, that they were attempting to trap him. What does that hypocrisy look like, or what was that about? Well, they begin by starting with sort of flattery towards him, don't they? They start by saying, we know you're a man of integrity who isn't swayed by others. And even in this, they're trying to get him to say something that will trap him. They're trying to get him to say something that's, that's boastful or that in some way puts him in a position. And who's there perhaps shows what they're trying to do. It says that they bring the Herodians with them. That there's likely Roman soldiers in the background and Herodians in there and they ask Jesus, should we pay our taxes? So what happens if Jesus says, no, don't pay your taxes? The soldiers probably arrest him, right? The Herodians certainly rally against him. But if he makes that approach, he's entered into that very political realm of making a very political statement about what to do with your tax money. And to be clear, this isn't the only spot that Christians are told to pay their taxes. We're told in other spots to do so as well. But that was some of the trick that, the, that those that questioned him were trying to play. So if he says, don't pay your taxes, he's in trouble. What happens if he says, pay your taxes? All the people are mad at him. 
right? Nobody likes paying taxes. And even more so in this society where there was this group of Romans that had conquered the area and was forcing unreasonable taxes on the people. And now this, this leader, this religious leader, this teacher named Jesus comes along and says, pay the Romans your taxes. They felt oppressed, and some of them were hoping that Jesus would even overthrow the Roman government, that that's what he was. And so if he said, pay your taxes, it would alienate all of those people. And so they formed and crafted this tricky question for which there is no good answer, or at least which either answer has a cost to it. And Jesus' response to it, of course, is wiser than anyone expected. He says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Yeah, it's a pretty common phrase in our society, isn't it? It's this idea that there are things that are meant for the, for the powers, for the government, and that there are things that are meant to God. And, and obviously there's truth to it. These words come out of Jesus' mouth himself and are in Scripture. And from this, many people, including Baptists, derive that there are things for which the church has responsibilities and things for which the government has responsibilities. And we may at times disagree what those things are, but there's this idea that there are things that fall under government care and responsibility and things that fall under church care and responsibility. Now, this isn't a division between physical and spiritual. Because there are physical things that the church is responsible for and spiritual things. And there are physical things that the government is responsible for. And I believe some spiritual things as well. And so there are lines between what we're responsible for, but they aren't just a spiritual physical line. It's a matter of what is under the church's government or control and what is under the state's government or control. So we see that Jesus is wise in how he responded, but his wisdom runs even deeper in that he responded with truth. So this wasn't just his way of avoiding answering the question. There is truth in the statement that he made as well. It's not just that he's wily or tricky and, and kind of comes up with this way to avoid it. He speaks truth and amazes them in his ability to not alienate either of those groups or advance kind of what was happening at the time. There are many times where Jesus speaks to his followers and says the time hasn't come yet for my arrest that there was a time frame that God had set in place for all that was to happen and if he had made this strong statement against the Roman government that timeline likely wouldn't have been followed or it would have been altered his arrest would have come sooner so we see that in this he was wise and yet he speaks the truth So we recognize that we do have competing responsibilities in life. And Jesus teaches us continually that we have a responsibility to fill, fulfill those responsibilities to different groups. And so we see this, that there's lots of scripture that talks about your responsibility to your family, right? There's lots of parts where it says, this is what we expect you to do within your family. There's other spots where it talks about what your responsibilities are to your boss, to your church, and all of these have a competition for your time. And what we see from Christ again and again is that he says that you have responsibilities to many different spheres in life and you are expected to respond to all of those. And so in here we see that you have a responsibility to family and to church and in this text to community and to government and to God and that those things are to be set apart. So from this, we derive the idea of that there should be no state religion or church. Now, you might notice that I'm avoiding using the phrase separation of church and state. Um, that is usually how Baptists talk about this stuff. And there's a reason I'm avoiding it, because that's a term that has taken on a very American connotation to it. And so uh, our dominant brothers and sisters to the south have taken that term and created or turned it into something that doesn't look very Baptist anymore at times. And so I'm cautious to use that term. But there is this idea that there is meant to be a separation between the church and the government, that there's meant to be ways we overlap and do things together, but that there is some level of separation. So how did we come to this place? It's my first his history lesson. So scripture doesn't say a lot about how church and government are supposed to interact. Why is that? Well, during the first three centuries of Christian existence, Christians existed as a persecuted minority in a world that viewed them with great suspicion. 
Early Christians saw themselves not as belonging to this world and so unable to commit to political factions. We saw ourselves as strangers and aliens, something separate from this world. And the government was glad to have us on the fringe because of how Christians would upend society, even unintentionally. And so early Christians existed kind of on the fringe of society. We didn't have much role in government other than they persecuted us and we were persecuted by them. That was what our relationship looked like. And so scriptures don't say a lot about how we are to engage or interact with the government. There's a text here, there's one in Romans, we're called to pray for our government. There are certainly things that it has to say, but it doesn't lay out in detail kind of what that relationship is to look like. A lot of that we extrapolate from texts like the one that we read today. And part of the reason is that the early Christians saw themselves as kind of this separate community, this different group from the rest that lived around them. Now, to be clear, they weren't saying that we should withdraw from society. They weren't acting as, as sort of Anabaptists do, that we, we pull out of society completely, for that would have been a denial of their mission. Christ came to save the world. We are called to preach and to baptize, to win others to Christ, to be salt and light in this world. So we're called to be present in this world, not to withdraw from it. But early Christians, Christians didn't have sort of a place within government. It took deep conviction to align with this group of persecuted and social outcasts that call themselves Christians. And so there weren't, those that joined weren't, didn't have deep connections to government. And Christians kind of define themselves almost as this, this distinct group that lives within but is not separate. We see one of these even in the language that, that the different groups used about who they were. So common language for the day was Rome described themselves as the eternal city. This has great implications. They saw themselves as existing for all time, that they would always be present, the final large government of its day. You know what Christians called themselves during that time? Altera Civitus, another city. One gathered from every tribe, language, and nation that lived within the rest, but will, were alternate to it, lived separately from them, had different practices. And so they were seen as subversives for, by this eternal city because there's this little group among us that keeps behaving and looking differently than we look, that looks to upend us. You know what, one of the early, uh, early uh, ideas that was often thrown at Christians, how one of the phrases that was used about them as, as sort of a, a put down, early Christians were considered to be atheists by the Romans because they only believed in one God. And how dare you be so presumptuous as to assume that your God is the one God. And so they were seen as this thing that is different, this thing that is outside, this thing that is separate. And they, in some sense, saw themselves that way, but felt a calling to live and breathe among the people, to be present with them, to share with them, to suffer amongst them. I think this is some of the idea that we need to reclaim in today's society. Because what we've seen is that the world has shifted past this spot where we were, uh, where we were kind of just, we, we used to have power in political realms, right? Christians once upon a time did. And many of us long for that to happen again. I don't think that's the right approach. We've moved past that to a place where we were kind of tolerated and now to a place where we're mostly persecuted, much like the early Christians were. But in some ways, we still just long for it to be as it once was rather than accepting the grace and wonderfulness of who we are now, that there is great cost to becoming a Christian once again, that it probably will cause you to be an outcast and that we should establish a separate city in some sense. Now again, this isn't, uh, Don Hutchinson calls it an under siege mentality is sometimes what we develop out of this and this is not what we're supposed to do. It's not that we're supposed to withdraw because we're under constant attack. No, we're to be present and able to, to present the gospel to those around us. But I think we're to once again assume that society will not see things as we see things to set up a section of, of how we do life that is separate and distinct and holy and set apart, to be sojourners or wanderers in the desert once again, to remember that we are part of this world but not of this world. So this is how the early church saw themselves, who they were, and how they understood themselves. Uh, if you want some more on this, this is the greatest book I have read, apart from scripture, obviously. Uh, it's called Another City, and it's got a big title, but it's, uh, it's pretty amazing and describes some of how we are to interact with the world today, I believe.
So what happened? What shifted? Something obviously changed in time. We spoke last week about, about Constantine conquering Rome and what that looked like, how he had a, a, a vision or a dream about God and then conquered the city of Rome. But even at that time, Christianity uh, was still outlawed. And so it wasn't until 313 that Christianity was no longer outlawed. And by 380 BC, Christianity was the official religion of the Roman Empire. So what did this mean? This meant that if you wanted to be a Roman senator or if you wanted to have political power or if your family wanted, had wealth and wanted to increase their importance, there were connections to the church that would bring that about. And so it was helpful to have a bishop or a pope in your family because the church at this time controlled great wealth all of a sudden. They were part of the establishment. And so if you wanted to advance in life, you needed to be a part of the church, both a member and certainly in the hierarchy. So what did this do to the church? Well, it attracted a whole lot of unscrupulous people to the positions of power, doesn't it? So if you wanted authority or power or money, sometimes the easiest way to accommodate that or define that was to join the church. What a horrible disconnect to the teaching of Jesus. And so into leadership, it attracted a whole lot of, of not very godly people. And we see the downfall of the church in this time, how it brought it to its knees. Now, at the time that Baptists began to arrive on the scene, they developed this idea that there should be a separation between church and state. And some of the reason was because they were a persecuted minority. And so they said, it's not good that the majority has power and authority. It would be best if we're all able to do what we want. So some of it was certainly practical in nature. But Baptists differed from other reform movements in that they sought, uh, in that the other reform movements often sought to replace the Catholic Church with a Protestant equivalent. So other reform movements thought, well, it's not that we, we don't want there to be a state church, it's that we want our church to be the state church. And so this is the language of kind of Lutheran groups and reformed groups of the day, were that they wanted to become the state church. And what this led to, of course, was the Hundred Years' War and many other wars where religion and ownership of land and wealth were kind of tied in as one. And they fought as if they were fighting for religion when really they were often fighting for wealth and land. But Baptists came along and said there should be a distinct separation between these two things. And these ideas were developing as Canada and America were being founded. And so we begin to see these coming out. The idea of the separation of church and state in the U.S. is very much a Baptist idea that was brought about by Baptist settlers in Rhode Island. That's where some of those ideas come from. They were very concerned because they just fled England out of persecution and they just fled mainland Europe out of persecution. They'd settled in the mainland and they'd settled first in places like Massachusetts and other uh, states that had very set religious practices, either Puritan or Catholic. And they'd been chased out of those places as well and ended up on this little island called Rhode Island. And so out of that, they very much advocated for this idea that there should not be a church state, that we should all be free to choose what church we want to be a part of. Now, Canada's history, of course, is a little different. You love history, don't you? Who here loves history? At least, I need a few hands. Okay, good. I'm going to keep going then. Um, Canada came out from a little different understanding. Um, from the beginning, the church was to be active in forming the public life in Canada. Well, we eventually arrived at the idea of no state church. The church was meant to be very active in the, st in the state life, in the political life here. Um, before Canada was even a nation in 1763, uh, there was a war between the British and French. Many of you know this. Uh, who won? The British, good job, you're on track. Uh, the British won, and in the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Paris, the British agreed to grant the liberty of the Catholic religion to the inhabitants of Canada. The king will, in consequence, give the most precise and effectual orders that his new Roman Catholic subjects may profess the worship of their religion according to the Romish Church. So what did that mean? You have this Anglican Protestant king acknowledging that he needs to give rights to Roman worshipers in Quebec, in Canada. What a bizarre thing. I mean, 100 years ago, that would have been impossible to imagine, but in this treaty, what the British king acknowledges is that Roman Catholic citizens of Canada have a right to practice their own faith, that he's not going to impose Anglicanism upon them. 
And it was kind of a, a loose, tense peace for a while. And we see how this plays out in the establishment of all the provinces in Canada. And so when Ontario was established, what is Ontario mostly? Protestant at the time. And so they set up this public school system, which was actually a Protestant school system. We call it public now, but it came from Protestant church roots in uh, kind of in opposition to what was going on in Quebec that had Roman Catholic school roots. And we start to see the different provinces established with this political and religious battle in the background of which church would control which reasons, region. Because you see at this time there was still many that hoped that there eventually would be a state church. That eventually there'd be enough Anglicans to create an Anglican country or enough Presbyterians to make a Presbyterian country or enough Catholic people here to create create a Catholic country. That was the hope of many. But from the beginning, there was this understanding that there would be some diversity of religion within this, within this nation. Now, there's certainly lots of conversations today, uh, both on the Canadian side and American side of the border, whether that extended to all religions or whether that was an understanding that there should just be a plural, plurality of Christian religions. And I'm not going to speak to that today, but they certainly understood that there was to be some freedom of conscience and choosing where somebody affiliated with a church. And by the time of Confederation, the church was largely responsible for many of the things that we've now passed off to government. At the time, we were responsible for education, for hospitals and health care, for care for the widows and the orphans in our country, and other charitable work feeding the poor and those that were starving, as well as the solemnization of marriage, which is one of the few things we still maintain. There was this understanding that, that these groups worked together to bring about the good of the people. Webster Grant puts it this way. He says, Canada grew up under the tutelage of its churches. The pulpit, the school, and the press were the leading forces in molding the Canadian character. By preaching, editorializing, and founding universities, they sought on one hand to lay the moral and spiritual foundations of a nation, and on the other hand to act as a conscience to the state. From the charter of our country, there was this understanding that the church had a role to play in the direction that was set. Even at the time of 1982, when we first wrote our Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, who's read that? Lots of people talk about it, very few have read it is what I've, what I've learned when I often talk about this. It's a, it's a fascinating document. The most fascinating part for me is how it opens. It begins with this line. Whereas Canada is founded upon principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Even in 1982, we still understood that the supremacy of God was at the foundation of who we were as a nation. That God was meant to be present in the laws that we wrote and that the church was supposed to have a role in understanding that. All right, my history lesson is mostly done. So why do I think this is important? I'm going to give you two reasons. The first is that how the church and government interact still has major implications for us today. I still believe that the church needs to be present in the public sphere, that we need to be allowed to speak and teach, that we need to have influence on the society around us, that we need to be able to do what we're called to do in the public places. And COVID certainly reminded us of how important that is and how difficult it is at times to find those boundaries between what the state is responsible for and what the church is responsible for. And without making you all twitch in a COVID conversation once again, I just want to acknowledge that that was difficult and that was often the root of many disagreements, was what the church had responsibility for and what the state did. Uh, in, uh, in his book, Under Siege by Don Hutchinson, he outlines a number of the uh, Supreme Court cases that have affected religious freedom in Canada. And there's some fascinating things in there um, about how this developed. Because after the Constitution was written um, in 1767, 1776, 67, see? 
you can teach me too. Um, much of how it actually plays out is, is, is played out in court law. And so uh, someone will do something, it'll go to court, and it'll end up at the Supreme Court, and they'll rule, and that'll affect how church and state work in this country. So let me give you an example. Uh, in Quebec in the early 1900s, and I don't have notes for this, so I might get some details of this story wrong, um, the Seventh-day Adventists were preaching in, uh, in Montreal, were street preaching. It was kind of how they, they looked to uh, to draw others to their uh, to their faith group, um, and the mayor of Montreal banned street preaching, and so he would just arrest Seventh Day Adventists when they preached on the streets. Um, and the problem was that there was one very wealthy Seventh Day Adventist person who would come along and just pay to get them out of jail every time they got arrested. So they'd get arrested, he'd come pay the fine, and they'd get out of jail, and then they'd repeat this over and over again. So the mayor of Montreal, who was a very Catholic person, um, wrote a law that that man could no longer go and release people from jail anymore. Pretty smart, eh? A little wily? Pretty smart, but that's the law he wrote. That went all the way to the Supreme Court, and it's the reason that our government today cannot write laws against a specific citizen. So they can't write laws saying that Rob can't preach on Sunday mornings. Um, because that went to the Supreme Court, it was decided there. Often matters of religious freedom are decided by other groups. And I know at times that's hard for us, but in our country the way the law works is that when our religious freedom is challenged even by another group, um, it can have heavy implications on our practice. And so we see that there are implications for us today in how the church and government interact. It's a big deal. The second is, I think, the more important reason, and this is the one you're going to talk about in your small groups this week, and that is this, that faith cannot be coerced. That faith can't be coerced. That there is no real faith if it's enforced by the government. Whether that's atheism or whether that's the practice of Catholicism or whether that's Anglicanism, that's not true faith. The government telling you that you are something does not make it so. And so because we believe in the priesthood of all believers, because we believe that each of us comes to Christ on our own, that we are each individually accountable to God for our actions, and that we need to come to him and seek forgiveness on our own, we believe that faith cannot be coerced by the government, that it shouldn't be enforced on us, that we should all be free to choose. And that's what I want you to discuss, at least in your small groups a little bit. There'll be a little more history, but I want you to spend some time talking about that idea of the coercion of faith that comes when there's a state government. Or, or sorry, a state church. So I want to be clear on a few things. Um, this is not a ban on religion in the public square. Quite the opposite. This idea of the separation of church and state is supposed to allow for the free exchange of ideas. I believe that the teachings of Christ come about through a conviction of the Holy Spirit, but that they are defensible by reason as well. And I'm comfortable having that conversation in the public sphere. I'm comfortable talking about those things. I'm comfortable engaging with ideas that Muslims might have or Hindus might have. And I hope that you are too. Because God, God comes to his own defense. He speaks through his Holy Spirit to those around us. And so I'm not worried or, or afraid of other religions that come to Canada. Quite the opposite, it presents an opportunity to present the gospel to them. There was a time where we had to send missionaries around the world to reach the peoples of the world. That's not the case anymore because people are coming here eager and excited to hear about God. I'm glad that I get to present those ideas both privately and publicly. The second thing that it means for us here is that, well, I will talk about political issues. I will not advocate for politicians from the pulpit. And I'm sure that brings relief to some of you and, and some wish that I would. But I will not advocate for a one politician over the other or put a politician down over the other. I will pray for politicians by name from the pulpit, but I will pray for them regardless of their political affiliation. Now again, that doesn't mean that I won't talk to issues that are political. Um, there was a, a theologian that said, in the early time of the church, you could not put a razor between the church and politics. These things are intermingled because they, we are talking about a different way of doing life. But I won't advocate for a person over another person. Instead, I'll talk about the issues and what I think Christ is calling us to be and do in this season. <laughs> 
So we have this final Baptist ideal, the separation of church and state, or that there should be no state church. And our main hope in that is that we can each explore the ideas that Christ has presented to us, both through the words he shared, the life he lived, and that that is written down in his word. And that we'd be able to freely draw a conclusion about what he says about who we are and who he is without coercion, without their promise of wealth or power because we make one choice or the other, but that we would instead live as this group that seeks to be faithful followers of Jesus in a world that perhaps at times speaks negatively about us. And that because of that, there wouldn't be an attraction to the gospel for power, but instead out of a need for forgiveness of sins, out of a humbleness, and out of a desire to follow Christ for who he is and what he's done for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, I do thank you for the ways that you engage with us. And while these ideas may not be central to your, to your gospel teaching, God, I do believe that they impo are important because they define how we engage and interact with the world around us. Lord, I pray for opportunity for each of us in the public sphere, at our places of work, on the streets, if possible, in coffee shops and in our homes and houses, that we'd be able to present the truth of who your son is. I'm thankful that we live in a nation where we're able to do that. And yet, bizarrely, those in nations that are able to do that sometimes tend to take that for granted and do it less than those that are in closed nations that are forbidden from doing so. So Lord, give us boldness in presenting your son, trusting that your spirit is at work in this world and will convince hearts of who he is. And then, Lord, we thank you for the freedom to make that choice, to make that decision for ourselves, to speak that into the world. In your name we pray, amen.